So we're still here at the Bontech slash Slice booth. So uh, one of the funny things is you guys decided to share a booth here, but I guess it kind of makes sense because these hot ends and extruders pair together really well. Yeah, we're obviously we're partners with Bontech. This year we decided to go really big at Form Next. All right, and we've got a bunch of excellent extruder and hot end combos here Absolutely. that show off all the different variations. Let's start out with what's your basic configuration? Like if someone was to just pick one of these up, what would they probably get? That's a, a hard question to answer because what someone needs to pick up varies so much on their unique application and their needs. Our favorite recommendation right now and what tends to apply to most people is some sort of shortcut configuration. You basically remove the heat sink from the slice engineering mosquito hot end, so you can do it with Mosquito or Mosquito Magnum Plus or Mosquito Prime, and you utilize the ACE cold block. You attach it to there, and it's gonna just conduct heat to this block on the front. You actually just like shorten the filament path quite substantially, so that allows you to get more torque, more power as you're feeding your filament through, um, but it also with that short filament path makes it really reliable for complicated to print materials and flexibles, which are very popular right now. Oftentimes, if someone's looking for a hot end extruder combo, if it fits their application, we try to do an ACE setup to make it as compact as possible. One of the things I notice about this is it looks very stout and robust yes. because everything's short, so you've got a lower uh, moment arm, so that should just basically make it sturdier. And then also you've got that system to reduce stress on the heat break, so you've yes. got those four posts that are carrying most of the load. I imagine this could just be smashing into prints and like it should hold up pretty well. Yeah, ideally it's not smashing into prints, but it is the, the design of our hot ends is to be durable, to be robust, to be crash resistant. Uh, you know, you need it to perform consistently all day, every day for years. That's the expectation. Just some interesting variants that I'm seeing on this table. Yep. Probably the most interesting to me are the, this Mosquito Prime, which is that ultra high flow variant. Yes. And also this water cooling one. What kind of customers use the water cooling block? Someone will use liquid cooling if they're using an actively heated enclosure. There are some people that'll get it for a non-heated enclosure just because maybe they're already doing liquid cooling in their system elsewhere. And so it just makes sense to utilize it for the hot end. But the vast majority of customers that are utilizing this technology, they're doing it in a heated chamber north of 80 degrees Celsius where air cooling is not effective. Your fan is going to just melt at that point. So liquid cooling becomes a more optimal option. You've got this one. I think that's like a conductive heating element. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So all of our hot ends come in one of three uh, cooling methods. You can get it air cooled and then you could like do air cooled LGX ACE. You can do liquid cooling, which we talked about, and then conduction cooling is the third method. Um, so any mosquito hot end can come in that way and all it does is it mounts to a metallic plate that you then conduct the heat to and essentially you just conduct the heat out of the system elsewhere. So you can cool it via a radiator um, or somewhere else in the system. It, it works the exact same way that the ACE setup does. This is like our conduction heat break. It is conducting heat to this plate and then you're cooling it there. But you could do that and have, you know, you're, you're routing the heat all the way out of the printer in places where, you know, liquid cooling is even not effective. If you're in like an insanely high temp enclosure, you're going north of 150 C or something, then conduct is gonna be your best option in that scenario because you don't even have to worry about the chamber temperature to cool the hot end. One thing I've noticed is that you guys are sticking with, for the most part, uh, circular cylindrical heating elements. Yes. Where a lot of the industry is moving towards ceramic heaters. Ceramic, yeah. Why would you stick with those cylindrical heaters, which yeah. a lot of people view as kind of like old technology? I think they, they're viewed as old technology. Obviously, uh, a lot of this was started and that, that was the standard. Now it's becoming maybe not as standard. We still do really like cartridge heaters, specifically why we're currently still using it. I mean, we're using it because that's what we're set up for. All of our hot ends use the same style heater that you can get from us or get from someone else. As we're looking towards the future, uh, future heating options, we're obviously, we're evaluating everything okay. and seeing what, what options are out there. For now, we do really like the cartridge heaters. I think you could make a good argument for reliability because it's like something you've got millions of testing hours on yeah, and you, absolutely. you know the failure rates yeah, and, versus if you change technologies, you're going to have to reevaluate. Yeah. We've you know built this confidence over time in those heaters and we like creating components that just work. And so making transition to new heating is never out of the question. It's just that's going to take a lot of time in R&D to get to a place where we have the same level of confidence in a new technology that we have. Uh, with the technology that we've already been serving to the industry now for about five years. So how much of the manufacturing do you do in-house? Because I know like yeah, yeah. one of the things that I've kind of been able to 
figure out based on looking at other companies is yeah, yeah. when you start outsourcing stuff, quality usually takes a hit. Absolutely, yeah. So like, how do you kind of balance the needs of flexible manufacturing where you have someone else do it and yeah. doing it in-house where you have more control? Yeah, I would say we, we manufacture probably between 95, 98% of everything is in-house. The only stuff that we outsource that we can't do in-house or some things that we just don't have the technical capabilities to do, like some of the electronic components and, and injection molded things, like it, it doesn't make sense for us to, to do that sort of thing. I would say any like machine part, our hot ends, our heat brakes, everything like that we're making in the USA. We're manufacturing those, we're controlling all the quality and insurance, um, controlling our own supply line, using high quality materials obviously. It makes them more expensive because of the time that goes into crafting them, into making them, into inspecting them. But we're really proud to be making our stuff in America. And I'd say, uh, yeah, almost everything we make is in, is in the US at this point. We've spent a lot of time talking about hot ends yeah. and, uh, and cooling solutions, but you yeah. also sell nozzles. We do, yeah. So you've got a couple new things. Earlier this year in May, we released the Gamma Master nozzle, and we've kind of talked about that some before too, but um, Gamma Master's our new, it's a, an abrasion resistant nozzle with thermal properties more similar to that of brass than hardened steel, so you get great thermal performance and thermal properties with the nozzle, but you're still getting the abrasion resistance of like our vanadium nozzle. We've got Gamma Master, which is kind of our line of nozzles. We have those in our standard kind of RepRap style. We have them in the Apex style for belt printing and non-planar printing. Uh, and then we just recently, about a month ago, released another one, which is our vase mode geometry. So right now it's just a, it's a 2.4 millimeter nozzle designed specifically for large layer lines, vase mode prints, uh, specifically designed for like prosthetics and medical applications. Uh, we're also seeing it used by companies doing props and costumes and those sort of things where it's not incredibly detailed, but they're needing to do large components and they're typically doing it in a vase mode format. Personally, I really like large diameter nozzles yeah. because instead of making like four repetitions going yeah. around the perimeter of a part, if you just do one thick layer, um, I don't have the data to back this up, but it, it feels like it's a lot stronger because yeah. it's just like a solid chunk of plastic. Yeah, it feels like, I remember uh, to Murph, you brought like that trash can that yeah. had very large layer lines. Yeah, it feels very durable, very solid. Uh, and layer lines just look cool uh, when, when they're done right, done cleanly, especially when they're really large, so. That vase mode nozzle yeah. has a 2.4 millimeter diameter. Yes. And as far as I'm aware, I have not seen a nozzle that does that where it expands to such a large uh, outlet. Because you would think your filament is 1.75 millimeters. Yep. How do you get that to expand out to 2.8 yeah. or 2. what was it? Yeah, 2.4. 2.4? Yeah, I do not know the uh, engineering behind it. I do know that it does this sort of thing. Uh, I don't know like exactly what that nozzle. looks like. Yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a similar sort of thing where it's it's kind of narrowing and then expanding back okay. out to that 2.4 millimeter orifice. That uh, tapering down is gonna help it kind of simulate it acting like a yeah. smaller diameter nozzle, yeah. but it's still going to be able to expand back expand, out yes. and, and make a yep. nice clean print. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to try one of those out yeah. because uh, I think it's really compatible with my design ethos of yeah. fat layer lines. Yeah, big layers, absolutely. All right, I think that's about all we have to, to look at for your new product lines. Um, keep an eye out for some sales that are coming up. I yeah, know Peyton's absolutely. always working on the sales on the, uh, the Slice Engineering website. I yeah. think they're doing something for the holiday season, so you know, I'll yeah, leave some are. links in the description below that you can check out. All right, well, Peyton, thanks for talking to us today and yeah. uh, seeing your new stuff. Yeah, thanks for stopping um, by. The only thing that I'd have to complain about this display is there's not enough boron nitride paste. There's not enough. Well, it looks kind of like boron nitride paste. Uh, but, is this solid but, boron nitride? But, I'd be but okay maybe, with that. But maybe next year we, we lay some out around the outside to make it really seamless. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, have a good rest of your show, cool. and I'll see you later. Sounds good.